In the previous video, I introduced change variables. There are many, many different changes of variables that are possible. However, for this course, I'm only going to focus on three. These are, however, the three most common and the most useful. The first of these three is polar coordinates, a change of variables for R2. A coordinate system is a way of identifying points in space. In R2, the standard coordinates identify points by their location along two axes. The point AB is A units along the x-axis and B units along the y-axis. The chart is a square grid and points are indicated by their position on this grid. However, there are other coordinate systems. Cartesian coordinates are not the only system. In this section on change of variables, the only transformations I want to consider are transformations to a different coordinate system. So, let me introduce the first of the other coordinate systems. Polar coordinates is a very frequently used coordinate system for R2. Instead of axes and xy coordinate, a point on the plane in polar coordinates is determined by two other pieces of information. The first is the radius, how far the point is from the origin, equivalently which circle centered at the origin the point is on. The second is the angle, measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis as usual, how far around the circle is the point in question. Between these two pieces of information, any point in the plane is uniquely identified. So this is a coordinate system. Well, with one issue. The origin is indicated by radius zero, but there is no angle at the origin, so this coordinate system has a bit of a strange problem at the origin. However, this problem can be worked around. This is the idea. What are the actual functions that do this change of coordinates? Well, if r is the radius and theta is the angle, then the x and y coordinates are just trigonometry. x is r cosine theta, and y is r sine theta. These are the functions that go between the coordinate systems, and I can invert these if I wish. The radius is just the length of the vector, which is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And similarly, by some trigonometry, if you want to get the angle from the x and y coordinates, you can take the inverse tangent of the ratio y over x. And again, these are the functions back and forth between the two coordinate systems. In the previous video, I said that the determinant of the Jacobian matrix was the term I needed to change the dx dy piece of multiple integrals. Now that I have the functions for polar coordinates, let me calculate this determinant. Again, for those without linear algebra, the matrix determinant part of this is not something I'm going to ask you to calculate, so if those terms are, all, are unfamiliar, the outcome here is all that needs to matter. The function is x equals r cos theta and y equals r sine theta. I take all four partial derivatives in r and in theta, the two variables of polar coordinates. Then I put these into the matrix of partial derivatives and calculate the determinant. I get a sine squared plus cos squared in this determinant, which I haven't shown the calculation of, but the result is just r as sine squared plus cos squared simplifies to 1. Therefore, the change of variables replacement is that dx dy will be replaced with r dr d theta. Let me give some interpretation about what is going on here. This Jacobian determinant, as I said before, is needed to account for the way that each coordinate system determines area, area since this is an R2. dx dy is a measure of Cartesian area. dr d theta is a measure of polar area, but these don't match up exactly. If I look at a little region of area and polar coordinates, I look at a little change in radius and a little change in angle. These two regions here are examples. For Cartesian coordinates, the same little change in x and little change in y gives the same square anywhere in the plane. But in polar coordinates, the small region for the same change in radius and the same change in angle is larger further out. What this says is that these small regions of area increase with the radius. Therefore, in this small piece of area, I multiply by r to account for this increase. The equivalent small piece of area to dx dy is r times dr d theta. You could also think of this in terms of units. The left has unit, units of distance squared. dx and dy are both like little tiny pieces of distance. dr d theta, though, only has units of distance. 
Angles are ratios of distance, so they have no units themselves. Multiplying by r, which is a distance, also gives units of distance squared on the right. Hopefully that gives a little bit of intuition for why these Jacobian terms are necessary. For little pieces of area can be different for different parts of a coordinate system. Let me go through a few more visual ideas for coordinate systems. I can think of Cartesian coordinates as a perfectly rectangular grid. What is the grid for polar coordinates? Well, the radius emanates outward from the origin in rays, and the angle sweeps around in circles. So the grid is this spiderweb configuration of rays and circles. And in many senses, this is the picture I have in my head of polar coordinates, these coordinate grid lines. What are some common regions that can be described in polar coordinates? Unsurprisingly, since the coordinate system is built around circles, the circle is a common region. It's all points within a given radius for any angle. I could also put a lower bound on the radius, all points between two given radii for any angle. What I get is a ring, and the mathematical term for such a ring is an annulus. If I don't want the whole circle, I can get a wedge by restricting the angle to a particular range. And finally, by restricting both the angle and the radius to particular ranges, I can get a portion of the annulus, an arc. The previous four regions all had constant bounds and polar coordinates. Let me show you what this looks like in integral setups. First, to integrate over a circle, I let the radius go from zero to some fixed radius capital R and the angle go all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. Notice that the dr is outside to match with the radius bounds outside, and the d theta is inside to match with the angle bounds inside. The function f of r theta is some function in polar coordinates, and I have the Jacobian term r where it should be in the integral. This is how I set up an integral over a circle in polar coordinates. Over a wedge, I still have the radius from 0 to some fixed capital R, but the angle is restricted to between some theta 1 and some other theta 2. Otherwise, the setup is the same. For the annulus, the radius is now between two different bounds, r1 to r2, and the angle is all the way around the circle to give the entire ring. And finally, for an arc, both angle and radius are between upper and lower bounds. As I said in the first video, in multivariable calculus, the main reason for changing variables is not to fit the function, but to fit the region of integration. If the region of integration is a circle, a wedge, an annulus, or an arc, I know now have very nice setups for these integrals, and this helps a great deal. I'll do some examples of this in the next video.